Welcome incredible agents and investors from across the country. Today is Thursday, January 9th, 2020, and this is mastermind call number 260. Um, we're all in different places today. Chad is in Texas. Uh, I'm in South Florida. Tim is on a plane. He's on the, on, in the sky today. So the three of us are here to answer your questions, help you. Nothing is off limit on these calls. Um, we we had a really good uh, role play call yesterday. Chad, you want to summarize that and tell everybody how to find it? Sure. So Jim seeked the, seeked the entire country on me to see if they could shut me down, and we had a good time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. If you guys, so we're actually phasing out. If if you've been with us for a while and you're used to seeing the the role play calls in the audio archive. We decided because people are finding more value in the video archive. So if you go, if you're in the subscriber portal under training, conference calls, well now when you click the call archive, it'll take you out to the conference call video archive. And what we're doing there, we post it as a video, we post it as an MP3 and with an audio link. So no matter how you like to consume the, the replays, you can take them with you, download them to your phone, whatever whatever works for you. So on alltheleads.com if you're not a subscriber if you go to the complete system that menu will drop down you'll see conference call archive or if you're in the subscriber portal you can go to conference calls and it'll it'll give you the archive button but we now have 50 hours of role play so if you guys didn't make the call and uh, you want to sharpen your skills on the phone there's lots of resources there to help you yeah and just a, um, the good news is even though it's video, it's just a background video. You don't have to actually look at us so that we didn't want to scare you away. <laughs> and, and a lot of people still aren't aware of how robust our search bar is. It, it is, honestly, I mean, it, it's not like I'm bragging, but it's the best I've ever seen anywhere. You can, re, you can just go to alltheleads.com in the upper right-hand search bar, and you can put in almost anything, put in uh, – the word role play and all the calls will come up. You can put a specific topic. It's kind of like Google. You have to play around with it a little bit, you know, try a little different combinations of words. But you can almost always go right to what you're having issues with. Um, you know, getting a certain objection, put the objection in, and you'll be able to find it. So we've really tried to make it easy for you guys to find virtually anything in the, what do we have now, Chad? How many hundreds of hours of recorded content? Like several we hundred, may right? be over, over. I think we might be over 700 at this point. Yeah, and Chad blew me away with a statistic that on YouTube, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there are between four and five people watching our content at a time. So we're 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 literally getting over 100 hours of than. watches. What much more than that now, Chad? I mean, it's a lot more people than that. So every every day, people, you guys are watching four days of our content. So right, I'll, yeah. Hopefully, we don't have anybody junkie that's been watching it. You know, take it one 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 item at a time. Go out and use it, like I say in these calls, and come back and uh, you know and move on from there. Uh, we do have two in the queue. We have plenty of room for more. What always happens on these calls? We try to make it an hour. But the first half hour, I beg for people to participate. In the last 10 minutes, we get eight people to jump on. So please, if you know you have a question or a comment, jump in early. Make sure we can get to all of you and still try to respect everybody's time and get the call wrapped up in an hour. So right now, we do have two in the queue. We have plenty of room for – yes, sir? Before we get started, I forgot to mention, so anyone who's been waiting on probate mastery, I, I just sent the email out right before this call. Um, January mastery is scheduled for January 20th, 21st, and 22nd. We'll start around 2 p.m. Eastern and go as long as it takes. Sometimes we're done by 4, sometimes by 6. So if you want to get signed up for mastery, check your email, look on our Facebook page, or go to the education and training page on the website. Perfect. And we now have three in the queue. Again, hit star six and hit one, and you can be the fourth. And first up this week is phone number ending in 7651. You're up first. Hi there. Are you there? I'm hey there. The I really don't have a question. I was just popping in to see what was going on. 
Oh, well, once you're in here, we have to do a thorough interview with you. So, so <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Is there anything specific that we could help you with? You know, I'm just brand new to real estate to begin with, and I um, I decided to uh, use probate as one of the spokes in my wheel and um, just want to learn as much as I can. Well, that's awesome. I can't remember who it was, Chad. We've had, we've had several people, but we had one in particular that just casually said in one of the calls, oh, yeah, I, I did three deals last week, and we said, oh, that's great. And we found out he was brand new in the business, and it was the first three deals he had ever done. And so that's the, you. The, we, the first one, I think, was back in 2014, a, uh, a lady named Tammy. And she listed seven properties in a week for, I think, 90 grand in commission. And you asked her if she had ever done that. And she said, I got my license 17 days ago. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. The, 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 the really nice thing about working this as a niche is such a large percentage of your leads are not local, and they don't know you from the real, you know, from the person that's been doing it for 30 years that has signs and advertising all over town. They're, you're you're just as qualified as anybody, so it's it's really a great niche for a new agent. And honestly, with the training you get here, you're probably more qualified than the experienced agents because you know you're not distracted with anything else. So. And you you're in the right bad habits established. Exactly. So you're definitely in the right place. That's great. All right. Well, we have two more in the queue, guys. Star six and hit one, or it's going to be. It's never a short call. I have confidence more people will jump in, but jump in now. It's star six and then hit one. And next up is phone number ending in zero one eight one. How are you guys doing? This is Alex in Chicago. Hey, Alex. Hey, Alex. Uh, quick question. I had a, uh, like, my first batch of letters went out, like, probably right after Christmas. Um, mm -hmm. And the guy, one of the, uh, I guess, uh, personal representatives called me yesterday, um, and he said uh, he, he said he has a car um, um, that was in his mom's name. His mom passed away, and he was trying to essentially uh, take control over it so I think his niece could, like, take it over or whatever the case is. And he was like, do I have a referral for an attorney? Um, and then we, 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 we talked, we chatted, you know what I mean, a uh, good guy, and then he, he talked about uh, his real estate, the fact that he and his wife were moving into his mom's house, so there wasn't real estate involved. So I guess I was just curious, would you guys, like, go to the extent of, like, you know, uh, trying to get a lawyer that he could uh, work with? Because I think he needed to take possession of the car. He's saying it's probate, like, the judge is telling him his best bet would be working with a lawyer in order to... Uh, uh, secure, I guess, ownership of the wheel. Yeah. So great question, man. This is what most people would call a junk lead, but there's a great opportunity hiding in it. So what a be what better way to open a relationship with a probate attorney than to offer him a referral in your first conversation? So if, I mean, the judge is saying he needs an attorney, he's telling you he needs an attorney, let's get him an attorney. And find an attorney on your list that's handling a lot of cases that you haven't met yet and go meet him face-to-face -face and say, listen, I spoke to a gentleman. We're actually not – he doesn't need our services, but he does need legal service, and I just want to make sure he gets to the right person. Have you got a couple minutes to talk? And that's going to show extremely well because everyone else, that if, if they are coming in the door, they're probably just trying from the mailbox or the phone. They're asking for referrals, not giving referrals. So, you know, it, it gives you an opportunity to help him out, to, to take some stress away from the situation, make sure that he's under, you know, he's, he has somebody to, to walk him through this. And it gives you an opportunity to really impress an attorney. So I don't think there's much, there's not, you know, this is a, the difference between direct and indirect monetization. So you can indirectly monetize this maybe 100 times over if you really impress one attorney versus, you know, versus their direct monetization, they're not selling anything, so you don't really have a way to be paid, but you can still help and, and you know, build a referral relationship. Gotcha. And then the, the other thing was, uh, just because of the time of the year it was, like my, I got the December lead, and then the first letters went out right at the end of December. Um, and obviously you just got the January batch. I'm wondering for you guys, from how you, how you would look at it for the January leads, uh, as long as it's not a budget issue, like would you immediately send out the January letters or would you try to do them all 
because obviously as I'm making calls and some people will be eliminated at the end of January, I'm going to be sending out the second letter for December. For the December leads, I'm wondering, like, would you guys wait and try to just do them all at once, or would you, like, for the January no. leads, you would get it out? No, there's a certain percentage of these, and you never know which ones it's going to be, but some people are highly, highly motivated, and they will That's find a solution quickly. And you don't, so you want to, the second you get your list, you want to get a letter out and be on the phones right behind it. Gotcha. Beautiful. That was it. Thank you. All right. Well, good job, guys. We got seven in the queue. That, uh, I won't beg anymore. That might actually take us uh, up to the top of the hour. But there is, I'm going to leave it open for another 15 minutes if you do want to jump in. Uh, next up is phone number ending in 8762. You're up next. Hi there. This is Christine. Um, I joined your organization just a couple months ago and honestly haven't been a, the best student, but um, did have the mailbox motivator and ISA service set up. And I'd say there's been about 50 letters that went out, um, maybe 20 contacts, and I have my first appointment. I'm very excited. Oh, great. Uh, nice. Yes. Um, I, you know, I'm not quite sure what I'm getting into, but she does have real estate she needs handled, and, you know, she just asked what a realtor could do for her, and I told her it was about providing all the services needed around the process that she's entering into and making it um, as simple and stress-free as possible. Um, and she made a comment, well, the house is a mess. I'm like, perfect. Uh, oftentimes, that's what we see. That's one of the ways I can help you. So it's pretty much how I won her over. Um, but I just wanted to call and you know, give a testimonial that, holy cow, this does work. Imagine if I worked it. <laughs> um, <laughs> and any, any tips you have or advice you have for me going in on my appointment Saturday. Oh, that's awesome. I, I will, I'll say the first thing I'll say is being new to this, you met an objection and went, you ran toward the obstacle. I'm proud of you. So many people, they, they come to us and say, well, I got shut down. They said they didn't want us to see the house because it was messy. And that's one of the most common objections we hear um, because a lot of people who keep a really tidy home, they're embarrassed to show you, yeah. you know, to be, to be associated. But the fact that you went toward that and, and made it an advantage of meeting with you is awesome. Like, you're doing that early. You're, you're going to do well, I think. But as far as, like, pointers for your appointment, you know, focus. Uh, like, you've probably heard, heard us talk about this before. Focus on people and situation. Real estate is a natural segue. Like, you really want to focus on building rapport and helping them understand the full scope of your service and that you don't get paid until you do what you promise. And then when it comes time to talk about real estate, you'll be the only one they'll be willing to have that conversation with. My, my only, um, not really apprehension, but you know, she was called me back and was like, you said you can help with all services. What about a tax attorney? I'm like, I got you. I said, why don't we do this? Let's meet on Saturday. Let me understand all your needs so I can make sure I connect you with the right people. You know, my apprehension, I guess anybody else getting into something new is I don't know what I don't know. So, um, you know, I'm going to be honest with her and whatever she asks for, uh, if I don't have the answer right away, I'm just going to go research it. But, you know, like the fear is her asking me questions about the process that I don't really know that well. Um, but, you know, I can cram in as much as I can so, between now and then. <laughs> here's what you can do in 15 minutes, I bet you, um, that you can completely exhaust all the, like, all your questions. What I, I try to encourage people to go meet with their probate clerk, but I don't know. What market are you in? Alexandria, Virginia. Yeah, so it can be – I mean, that can take a day of your time in D.C. traffic. So at least call the probate clerk and introduce yourself and, and say, you know, listen, I, I've got a, I'm building a team of folks here in Alexandria that are to help families in probate with all the non-legal aspects, of course. And I just I have a few questions. Do you can you or somebody in the office help me just for a few minutes? And then just fire away. Like everywhere you have a blind spot, ask a question. They're a public employee. And I've done this in markets all over the country with other people. And every single clerk I've ever spoken to was helpful. The the most complicated one was in um, I think it was San Jose, California. We had to bounce around two or three people until we got to, I don't remember the job title, but they actually have an, a licensed attorney that works in the probate office to, a, to answer public questions. But every time I've ever done this, no more than 15 minutes, 
you'll run out of questions. And it'll give you a lot of clarity and comfort around your local process. So if there's okay. one thing that, that I do hear in your – like the, the real apprehension I hear is you're, you're afraid you're going to get stuck on more of a, a procedural question. So just call the probate clerk, and, and you know, it's a good relationship to have, and it, it honestly gives you a lot of credibility. So when you're meeting, when you're meeting with folks, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, you know Kim down at the – did you guys right. initiate the process with Kim? And it's amazing how they're like, oh, you know Kim? Well, she's so nice. She was so helpful. And you, you, you get in rapport. So it's just knowing those people down there will make this less intimidating, will fill in your blind spots, and uh, you know, might even – help you out with, you know, those people can start referring folks to you. I'll do that. You know what I, Thank you very much. What I was going to add also, I, as much as you're concerned, I, I guarantee you, you know a lot more than the, uh, the executor does about probate, and it's highly unlikely they're going to ask you anything you don't know. Um, mm -hmm. If they do, if they do, you know, you have a little bit of fun with it, say, well, that's a great question. And all the probate deals I've done, you're the first person that ever asked that question. <laughs> you know, that. let me, <laughs> you. let me, or, or, or which is, which is the truth. And uh, let me, let, you know, who good answer to that would be a good person to answer that question would be the attorney. Let me give them a call. I'll get right back to you. People don't mind that you and I think it's actually refreshing to admit that you don't know something. People don't mind that you don't know as long as you're able to find out. But but mm -hmm. I'll I'll bet I'll bet you ace it without getting stumped. Period. But uh, yeah, you know, as soon yeah. as you're able, you, as soon as you're able, go through mastery. Also, if you haven't already, what I was going to ask. I have. I have. Oh yeah, yeah. good. Okay. In in all of these appointments, like. Very, very few people want to talk about anything, any, any kind of legal type or procedural questions. Most of it is just right there on that property. They're worried about the car out back, or what do you do with a satellite dish that was from 1983, or you know, what, how the, how the heck are we going to get this thing cleaned out? So most of your conversation is around the actual real estate, not around the probate. We're offering such a broad scope of service just to have give them a lot of reasons to engage with us. But by the time you get to the appointment, you're pretty much there to talk about the personal property, the real property, and the timeline. And in mm -hmm. Virginia, you know, we have a very simple probate process. There's not a whole lot to be aware of. They can, you know, you don't need court approval. They can list it, sell it. The money goes into the state's bank account, and they get, you know, when the, when the probate's closed, then they get that. But uh, – it's pretty simple in Virginia, so you're okay. you're going to do great. Thank you. All right, great, good job, guys. We have seven more in the queue. Next up is phone number ending in eight three eight three zero nine. You're up next. Uh, yes, can you hear me? This is Chris Hennessy. Hey, Chris, welcome. How are you? I am actually good. new. Uh, to the whole program, and I've I've been looking at some of your emails and some of your stuff, and I don't know a ton about. The program. I the reason I was actually interested in getting on a call. I have a team, um, and I'm looking at you know just generating some more organic leads. I focus mostly on listings, and my I have three buyers agents on my team, um, and just generating more listings. That's really what I'm looking for. Couldn't be in a better place. place. Yeah. yeah, and I have your phone number. I have a really good feeling when this calls over, one of our salespeople might reach out to you. If that's okay. That's fine. Yeah, I'm in the Philadelphia suburban market, um, and I I was 15 years with Remax, and just a year ago switched over to Keller Williams, and um, just looking at getting away from any Zillow or Realtor.com leads, and looking at yeah, you know, I, I, I have a large referral business in my area, um, and really just looking at growing some of the listings. I do have some attorneys that I've worked with over the years, but never really strategically or intentionally gone after it. That's great. Yeah, if you it, – it, not to belittle Zillow, but um, a lot of the – Zillow and a lot of those leads are people, you know, that happen to visit a website or express some interest, you know, online. Uh, this is really apples and oranges. These are actually often uh, absentee owners that just inherited property they weren't planning on owning. And your conversion rate on these leads – first of all, your competition will be so much less, and your conversion rate should be so much higher. So we would we'd love to great. have you as a have as a customer. I'll have someone reach out to you right after the call. Yeah, that'd be great. So I can learn more about how you guys work. Sure, appreciate it, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Yep. All right. 
Next up is phone number ending in 1455. You're up next. Hi, this is uh, Tito. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Hey, Tito. Um, yeah, I, I have a question. Um, so I was talking to a, a uh, lead yesterday, and she um, said there's just two properties involving the estate, six kids, four wants to sell. Um, one one child is picking is actually uh, one family member is living in the property for free. The other property is collecting rent, but the other siblings aren't getting the money. So she wants to sell her interest in the state. And how do we go about doing that, or what's the opportunity there? Is there a will? Um, I um, I don't think there's there's a will. Okay. Um, and there's so, like the the father passed away nine years ago, and and okay. four of the siblings want to sell. And probate has been opened, right? Um, that's a great question. Was um, this off I of a, an outbound call or somebody lead. that called you? No, it, it was uh, it was on a um, it was on one of your leads um, that that okay. we got from you, but then okay. it that ended means, up. So somebody has, has initiated the probate process. So were you speaking to that person, the personal representative? Uh, yes. Okay. So they initiated the process. No one in the family objected to that, or at least they didn't show up at court to do that. So they've been appointed. So at this point, state law determines, you know, who gets what. If, if it's in test state succession, there's no, if there was no will. So each of the kids will have an equal share. Now, if some don't want to sell and others do, I mean, they have to sign a release. So for her to be able to sell her shares, I mean, the most likely scenario would be that, you know, she would sell it to one of the other family members. But oftentimes they can't afford it. They can't qualify for right. financing. They've, they've lived in the house for free their whole life. And so this is a, I don't, I don't want to say it's terribly common, but it, you, will, you will encounter this more than once. Um, and you've probably heard of cash for keys and foreclosure. One of the reasons I, tr I try to tell people to add a, you know, a senior moving company, a social worker, uh, st uh, climate controlled storage facilities, this is the reason. So if you can find them suitable housing and get them to move out, then they're going to get money for their share of the real estate. But if you, for example, if you go to a social worker and say, I have a, a low-income individual that's been living in their parents' home, the executor needs to sell the home, we don't want to make this person homeless, can you please reach out and help them with their housing needs? That person is going to know the state housing authority, like they'll know where the, 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 the money is. Like sometimes they get a HUD voucher, like in Virginia, we can get a VHDA voucher. But I've had to do this before where you basically let the social worker find them a, a, a bit, an alternative living situation and work closely with that social worker and show them. You, you sometimes have to show the family member, listen, you know, you can stay here and not pay anything or we can get you subsidized or potentially free housing and you get all the equity that you're due from this estate. And some, sometimes that's enough where they're like, oh, my God, yes, I'll move out tomorrow. And other times they're so emotionally wrapped up in that, that that they're not moving. And this is where sometimes these things drag on for years because they end up in litigation because the family members who don't want to sell won't sign, and the other family members are kind of stuck and can't do anything. Um, so your, I would say your best bet is to try to build rapport with the person in the home and see what their, you know, what their goals are. If they would rather live in a, in a, you know, a place with less maintenance and less responsibility and little to no cost, you might be able to get them moved out into, you know, on a, on a HUD voucher or something. Um, and if you need help, like there's a lot of a lot of questions you're going to need to ask. Like, are they mentally challenged? Are they physically capable of living in certain places? Um, you know, we certainly never want to make anyone homeless, but you, the majority of the family is being held hostage by the minority that doesn't want to doesn't want to sell. Um, so that's the way I would approach it first, and maybe even if you can get them to come to a family meeting where everybody can be part of this conversation. Where you could say, you know, guys, listen, I'm not sure how to help you guys, but if we could just meet for a few minutes on Friday 
where I could understand everybody's goals and everybody's situation, then I think I'll be clear on exactly what can be done. Do we think we can get everybody together? And even if that's a phone call, just try to get everyone in one place, and I think you'll you'll probably learn a lot. You'll probably get the real story. You'll see if there if there is a lot of tension between family members. And what you're looking for is what's the real excuse for them still living there? Was there an agreement for them to move out and they just, just ignored that agreement? Like what has happened up until now? Nine years is a long time. Chances mm-hmm. are they've, they've agreed to move out and just didn't, if I had to guess. But I, I think, you know, before you can really know how to take action, I would get some more information. But mm-hmm. probably your, probably, you know, the ace up your sleeve is finding that person, you know, meeting that person's, meeting everybody's needs. So get that person an even better place to live for no money like they have now. And they, they lose the responsibility of property maintenance and, and all that and the cost of property maintenance. And they get a, 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 a fair, you know, suitable place to live. And then the rest of the family can get it emptied out and sold. Hey, Chad, listening to your to your uh, answer, I, I have a question. I, do you have an opinion if if this was if it was five to one, and one person was holding them hostage, and it did go get dragged out in litigation? I, I assume that eventually the court is probably going to make that person move. Would would you agree? Is that the likely outcome, or not not necessarily? There's there's just too many variables. I mean, if they're mentally challenged or they don't have an income and they don't have a way to support themselves, the court is, and it depends on the court jurisdiction too. Like in Roanoke, no. We have pretty liberal judges that will will usually side with that person. So they kind of control it. But, I mean, the best way to work it out is outside of court and certainly outside of litigation. I just wondered if that was any leverage. I wonder if it was any leverage to to say to the person, you know, if this gets into litigation, you may end up eventually have to move anyway. You know, it'd be much better to to do it, you know, in in a in a way, you know, on your own terms and get some money out of the deal. But I guess uh, if that's not a valid threat, maybe maybe not. I mean, it it's is certainly a possi- worth a try. Yeah, it, it certainly is I mean, a possibility. That would, yeah, that would be my contingency plan for sure. You can catch more yeah. flies with honey than gold. Sure. Does that help, Tito? Uh, yes, that helps very much. Thank you, guys. I, I yeah, and thank you for your you. thanks for your brave contribution on the uh, role play call yesterday. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Take care. Next up is phone number ending in three zero seven five. You're up next. Yeah. Hi. This is Bill Seegers, and um, I'm a prospective uh, client. Great. Well, I have your phone number too, so our sales team will be busy after this call. <laughs> I, um, so I have a question regarding uh, probates. I'm in uh, Northern California, and my understanding is a lot of folks are in trusts. And the number of, um, you know, I could tell you what county I'm in, Nevada County, and it's kind of a small rural county, uh, 100,000 people roughly. And uh, I think there's an estimate of about 12 probates per month coming across. And um, I'm just wondering how, um, you know, if it's just probates or if it doesn't matter whether they're in a trust or, you know, how how that all works. So will it be okay if we give you the trust leads for free? Yeah, I'm, 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 that's what I expected. Okay. (laughs) That's how that happens. So I'll do that by teaching you how to fish, not giving you a fish. So in Marin County, I think there's 30 leads a month. And one of our subscribers who has been with us from the very beginning, he's doing, I don't know, probably 35, 40 deals a year out of Marin County for Mm -hmm. over a million dollars, well over a million dollars in gross commission annually. So you can certainly get a lot from this campaign in that market. You're right, trusts are extremely common in in your area. And they're not ever a matter of public record. However, um, we we kind of teach a two-prong approach. One side is marketing, and the other is re- building a referral network. So those 15 a month or whatever it is, you know, certainly send them the letters, make the phone calls, and follow up regularly. But in your free time, when everybody else is calling their other 300 leads because probate's more common in their markets, that's when you get in your car and you go get face-to-face with every probate attorney in your area. 
and gotcha. there's something I'll point you to if you haven't seen it yet. If you, I, let me, the easiest way to get to this, if you go to alltheleads.com, in that search bar in the top right, put in Fraker, F-R-A-K-E-R, and that's an hour-long interview. There's a video blog that I did with a probate attorney just south of you, actually. And uh, he has 30 years' experience in, in that market as a probate attorney. And we basically just pulled the curtain back and showed everybody exactly how you can really provide value to the attorneys and build this network. But if you can create those relationships, you know, the, the, a, a trust is, is most of the social motivating factors in probate are also present in a trust. You know, we all have houses. We don't need mom and dad's house. It's full of stuff. It needs to be emptied out and sold. Like even even though they, it's not a matter, there's no court oversight and it's not a matter of public record. All the social dynamics are pretty much the same. They're in a different income bracket usually, but they still need to sell things and settle things out and move forward. So that if you can get to know the probate attorneys and the family law attorneys, well, I think in your area they're always called estate planning attorneys. Um, if you can get to know those people and help them understand that you have a team of people to help families in transition, not just in probate, but in trust and guardianship um, and divorce, like it's not uncommon for those attorneys to feed you a steady flow of deals. Um, and that's pretty much Bill. Bill, you know, he did that well from the beginning. And even though he gets a, a low count on leads, he's still able to, to pull seven digits a year out of this. Yeah, I actually talked to him yesterday, and that's why I figured it out. I didn't want to bother him for his time. He sounded bit, he was great. Yeah. He was uh, wonderful to talk to as a as a referral, and um, I, so that's why I figured I'd call in and just uh, get that sort of answered from from you. So that hey, Chad, I think if I'm not if I'm not yeah. mistaken, Bill Bill started out with the leads. He noticed that in some cases the executor and the attorney were one and the same. And he, he started prospecting those, and they were professional, what, what do you call it, professional uh, mediators. For, and I think that's fiduciary. how he got his start. Yeah, ex fiduciaries, yeah. That's so actually how he got was, his start. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the other point I was going to make, so you definitely have fiduciary groups where they get together at least once a month, and you can pay like 325 bucks to be an affiliate member and actually attend their meetings. So you can... Typically, a fiduciary is appointed when there are no heirs or there's infighting in the family, and the judge wants to avoid litigation. They'll appoint a third party and sideline everybody else. So those are really good folks to know, and they are, you know, they're doing this professionally every day. That's what they're doing. So it's a very B2B transaction. There's not much emotion attached. So I would encourage you to, I think, you know, because you, you have a less to, you have less to do on the marketing side and less cost. I would encourage you, we, we spend quite a bit of time on this in Probate Mastery, our training. I think go through Mastery, really focus on, you know, marketing soon, like market as quickly as you can to your, your the few leads you have, and then spend the rest of your time really building out your referral network. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's great. Uh, all right. Appreciate your input. Good, good stuff. We have five more in the queue. Next up is phone number ending in one four two nine. Hi, my name is Ryan. I'm from uh, Western New York, and this is a quick question for Chad. Um, my so this is not regarding an actual probate lead. My neighbor passed away, and her son, who is out of state, is the executor. I don't know him very well, just you know from passing when he's visited. And my question is, when she, so I, I went to her funeral and talked to her son, but I didn't bring up, you know, anything professional or probate or anything like that. And I got his phone number just because I'm her direct next-door neighbor if he needed anything because he's from out of town. But when would be a good time to talk to him about that? Because I, I, already missed the boat. I already missed the boat because another agent already has the house listed, and it's only been like two weeks. So he was obviously mm -hmm. motivated, but... My question would be for you personally, when would be a good time to talk to somebody like that that you know or, you know, kind of know? Is the house vacant? Uh, it is now. She was living there, so it's only been vacant for three weeks. Okay, perfect. So 
they've got one more week with their standard homeowner's policy to cover that asset. So in one week, whether he knows it or not, there's about a 99% chance the insurance won't be valid. If there's, a, if there's a loss, it won't cover it. So I would reconnect and say, listen, I know you've got the home listed. I'm not talking to you as a realtor. Uh, my uh, ethics are important to me. But one of the things I notice most all attorneys and all families overlook is that if a home sits vacant for more than 30 days, a standard homeowner's policy won't cover it. So being in the middle of the wintertime, if, if you were running a gas and the heat were to go off and bust every pipe in the house, you would lose you know, most of the value out of, out of the estate. So I've actually already talked to my insurance guy. I, he's, I've, I've got a quote in hand just to make sure that, that you've got the asset covered. And I'm pretty sure you haven't done that, have you? Actually, and no, you're going I'm a mastery student in the earth, so I've actually already brought that up to him. <laughs> <laughs> good, good job. Um, but the other thing is, you know, property preservation is probably, especially during this time of the year, that's probably the biggest concern. If the realtor's not taking care of that, you could call and just say, hey, you know, do you, you want to give me, or I've, there's a lockbox on it since I'm a realtor. Uh, I just wanted to offer, I'll go through it at least once a week and make sure everything's okay, the heat's on. Like you might, you know, as, as a neighborly gesture, just offer to do that. And then that's the, that's the reason to get on the phone and then find out if there's anything else you can help him with. And do you feel like it's priced fairly? Uh, it, it's pretty, pretty well priced. I mean, a little bit over what I would have done, but I mean, in this market, it's probably going to sell. Yeah, so I wouldn't, you know, you're going to have to stay away from the, the conversation about the real estate just ethically. I wouldn't kill yourself on it because if it's priced right, it's probably not going to expire and the other the other agent's going to get paid on it. Um, yeah, but that's, that's what I'm that, thinking. So my main question would be, let's just say this happens again. I actually live in a older neighborhood, so this is probably going to happen to me again in, sometime in the future. What would be your best, you know, guess as to what would be a good time frame to discuss something with that? Like a week after, because they they didn't even file for probate yet. I haven't even seen their lead come through yet. Interesting. Well, if they do get it under contract, they're not going to be able to close it. Yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure what the thought was, but you know, I don't know. I'm not sure. Have you looked at the tax record? Did they quit claim it out to another family member before the death or anything? Um, so our tax records up here take a little bit of time to catch up. There's a little latency, but it's still in the, the mother's name. Okay. Yeah, so what's going to happen when they, when they pull title on it, they're not going to be able to close the chain of title without the uh, letters, testamentary, death certificate, and, and, you know, list of assets, list of heirs. So the agent might not be aware of that, but they will be as soon as they run title. Right. Um, so it probably won't blow the deal up. It's just going to delay the closing, and the buyer's going to be surprised. But as far as <clears throat> other ones in the neighborhood, one of the, if if you've got an elderly neighborhood and most of the kids live out of town, I think having a good solution for property preservation um, is is good. Like if you have a contractor or a handyman that can go go by and you know check on the house, fix anything that that you know make any minor repairs like that's a good soft offer like you're not trying to talk about selling the house, you're trying to talk about protecting the house since nobody's going to be there anymore. And that's a common thing. Most families will try to find a neighbor or somebody and give them a key and kind of make them a, you know, at some to some extent a caretaker for the property. So I think that's a you know, that's a a territory that people wouldn't feel offended if you were bringing that up. And then that gives you a reason to check in with them once a week. And when they're ready, they'll start talking to you about what their option. They'll start asking what their options are, what they should do. But I think being, uh, you know, a, a part of the community, you can offer some sort of, of property maintenance or preservation as kind of a, a conversation starter and not really hurt any feelings and, you know, not give them the wrong impression. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for your help. All right, thank you. Three more in the queue. That should take us up nicely to the top of the hour. Next up is phone number ending in 0577. You're up next. Hello? Yes, sir. Oh, this is Joe. Yeah, I had a question. Um, I went on a listing appointment over the summer, and I found out that the title was under the 
deceased spouse. Uh, I gave them some recommendations, uh, some of my attorneys, and they ended up not using any of my contacts. They went to the Navy base, went through the naval attorney, and then came back with me recently to list the property. Uh, I saw the title did change into the estate of, then it was a deceased person's name, and it was a spousal or domestic partner, partner property order. Then when I read it, it says something like, um, it's basically decedent surviving spouse, then it's the name of the, the husband. Then it says here the property is described um, is basically um, under the, the spouse, and then I got a power of attorney for the daughter. I got an offer on the property yesterday, and now it was back into an individual the person that's deceased. How do do I have to fix something in escrow? Are these the right amount of paperwork I need, or do we have to fix something here? You mean so on on tax record it changed to the title title changed and then changed back? Am I understanding you right? No, it didn't change back. So it was changed through the naval attorney, whatever they did. I, I'm not 100% sure if they totally went through probate, but it, it is changed now into the state of, then that's the past spouse name, but I also have this document called a spousal or domestic partner property order filed with the court, stamped, and all that good stuff. Um, and it says the court finds um, this person died and the decedent, then they check the box surviving spouse, and they named them. Then the court further finds and orders 5A, the property described in attachment 5A, property passing to the surviving spouse or surviving registered domestic partner named in item 4, and no administration of it is necessary. Then number right. 7A, the property described in attachment 7A is property that belonged to the surviving spouse or surviving registered domestic partner under Family Code Section 297.5 and Property Code Sections 100 and 101 and the surviving spouses or surviving domestic partner's ownership upon decedent's death is confirmed. Uh, is this enough paperwork to get escrow opened? Because the offer yep, that came in, I'm good? So this, is, this just means that whoever their, their closing attorney or title company was was savvy and they, they did title the property, property correctly. So essentially what's happening is the real estate is being carved out of the estate. So it can, it can be dealt with separately. So it, when, like when they, like spouse B will be able to receive the funds for that and without it going through the estate bank account and being caught up in probate. Um, <clears throat> what state are you in? California. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's incredibly good in California. You just saved them thousands of dollars in eight or nine months of time, um, or whoever whoever titled the property correctly. So, they have they've gotten good guidance, um, and you shouldn't have any obstacles. They'll run title. They'll see that they'll they'll be able to see the chain of title, and that document you have will close it, and you should have no delays. Beautiful, beautiful. So I don't have to have the other agent change the purchase agreement or anything like that shouldn't have to beautiful awesome thank you yeah that's a that's a good one in California that's actually pretty rare a lot of times people don't you know they hold property as tenants in common or just one spouse and that way it has to go through probate and you have to go through court confirmation and overbid and everything else in California so this one's probably going to be one of the simplest ones you'll do in your state good to hear thank you so much Absolutely. Jim, you still there? Uh, yep, I'm here. I was uh, accidentally muted myself out. Thanks. Um, next up is phone number ending in 2198. You're up next. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Hear you. Oh, hey, this is Beverly. I'm pretty new to the program, but I have a question about um, at what point in time do you, like when you were talking to the first caller, I believe, and she was saying that she would meet with the people and help them with, you know, people, to, you know, sources to help them clean out the house, have an estate sale, storage, whatever they need. At what point in time do you give them this information versus when do you get them to sign the, you know, a potential listing agreement with 
without dates on it or I don't know how how you know I just worry about giving out all this information and then you come back to them two months later and oh thank you but we've decided to list with so-and-so right that's why you give it out in person they have to look you in the eye to get the information right so we don't make brochures giving up all of our like disclosing all of our team members that's that comes with meeting with me right mm -hmm. so the the idea is to find any reason you can and looking at the you know looking at the home and the personal property situation is usually enough but find whatever reason you can to get face to face as soon as possible as soon as they're ready and willing to meet with you um, and then mm -hmm. once you get there you'll start to explain like you know everything that you can do to help and and uh, this is something you know we kind of break this down in depth and mastery but really focusing on their needs and their goals giving each of the family members a voice and then mm -hmm. they'll basically they'll lay out your roadmap and tell you exactly what you need to say and when you get to the end of it like I establish a target date as an anchor and then I back my way up so for example if this was going to be a listing instead of an acquisition we would I would say you know perfect world when would when would you want all this to be done and we set that anchor on a target date and let's just say that's April 15th tax day mm -hmm. so, okay if we're going to do that we need to have it on the market by March 1st in order to do that we would need to have uh, photography done by this date staging by this date clean out by or clean out by this date the estate sale on this date and that brings us right back here to today just sign there press hard there's three copies and you never have to ask for a listing. I'm wow. batting a thousand, a thousand on this. By, by using that target date as your anchor, you mm -hmm. back up through, through the timeline, explain each of the people that are going to be contacting them, and then just mm -hmm. slide the listing agreement over and drop the blue pin, and they'll sign it every time. And you just post date it for the, the date that you set as your target date and then adjust it if you have to? Depends on your contract. Mine has a listing date and an MLS mm -hmm. date. So, like mm -hmm. on, I'll put today's date on the listing date, yeah. or the the agree the date of agreement, and then the listing start date is the future right. date. Yeah, our contracts are like that too. Okay, sounds good. Um, one other quick question: I'm, to be calling, what kind of time frame for like a hundred calls? How much time should I block? Because I haven't ever done this. I haven't. I've been an agent uh, for eighteen years, but I've never called. Your pace is probably, most people hold a pace of about 12 per hour, and that's if you're calling all four numbers, leaving voicemail, and having conversations. And don't get discouraged. Your contact rates are probably going to be 25 to 50 percent because it's hard to get people to answer the phone these days with so many robo-dials. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that's getting better, but you're with a, with a contact rate of 25 percent and rolling through all the numbers, leaving voicemail, you can count, account for about 12, 12 an hour will be your pace. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. All right, awesome. I think we're going to finish on time today, Chad. We have one last person in the queue. Last up today is phone number ending in 0098. You're up last. How you doing? Um, this is Daniel. Um, I'm in Daniel. Texas. And I, how you doing? Yes, sir. Good. Um, I have a question about, you know, a particular deal that I'm working on. Um, it has to do with the probate. I'm sure that you guys have been through this before, um, but I'm having a little trouble with this one. Um, so sure. it went to probate, of course, and owner, the, the, the deceased, um, invited a homeless man about three years ago into her home. Um, she ended up dying, of course, and he actually is kind of claiming the property. He doesn't want to leave. The owner doesn't really know what to do at this point and is really motivated to just get rid of it and whatnot. And um, the guy actually had the smart to go down to the court and uh, basically appeal it. Um, and I looked up everything that I possibly could, anything from, you know, squatter's rights to adverse possession to, you know, eviction. And, and I'm, I don't think that he could appeal an eviction because there was never really a lease involved. I mean, this was just somebody that she, you know, invited into her home, been living there ever since, um, you know, and so on. So um, he, you know, he's basically kind of stuck and I'm trying to, you know, kind of overcome that objection, but I can't really seem to get through um, to her. So um, she wants to make sure that all this is basically taken care of before, you know, uh, beforehand. So. Um, you're in, you're in Texas. Yeah, yeah. 
Don't you, don't you just like call a cowboy with a lariat to go over and rope his ass out of there or something? I uh, know I would. And you know what? I went over there myself. I went over there myself and actually knocked on the door. I was willing to give this guy a couple thousand bucks, cash the keys, get out. You know? Yeah. Uh, but you know, at this point, he's really saying that this is basically his house. He actually went down to the courthouse and said, "This is my house," and I, and we can't figure out how, what he's he's even appealing. You know what? Well, what chances could, are. I mean, yeah, he's he's fighting for for all he has, but he didn't earn it. And I think, I mean, you're in one of the better states to deal with this situation because you do have a more conservative government that, that won't really stand for stuff like this. However, there, like I said earlier, a court is always unlikely to create another homeless person, especially if it's in a city that already has a homelessness problem. So the cash for keys is the best approach here if you can just get the guy to go away. Um, otherwise, you, you're going to want to have an attorney involved in this. Um, someone, I mean, unless he's been there for 20 years and everybody knew about it, then he's not going to be able to claim the rights to that property. I, I doubt he hasn't been there 20 years, has he? No, he's been there for three years. And, you know, yeah, Edward, he, has, I, he has no claim. Yeah. So you're just going to have to go through the legal process of having whatever that is in Texas. I'm, I I'm, I'm, don't have much experience here, but you know, a sheriff needs to show up and say, okay, you can go to your new home or you can go to jail. Which is it going to be? And they're going to, he's going to have to, to reconcile that, that it's not actually his home. Um, if he was smart, he would take the money and run. Like he would just, you know, give him a deadline and 2000 bucks is more than enough to get a moving truck and, and first, you know, a, a security deposit and first month's rent. Okay, so you don't you don't think he fits in the the whole adverse possession? I don't rule. think so. I, I don't know, and I'm not familiar. You know, I'm not really familiar with Texas law. I haven't read it, but in most in most states, it's 20 years. When and and the the heirs to the estate have to have knowledge of that person being there, then they can they can do you know that then they can can file for for ownership rights to the property after that 20 year period. But three years, I don't, I don't think he has any claim to it. Um, the other thing you may do, since this is a homeless person, um, they will, you know, they'll qualify for subsidized housing or free housing. So if you were to get a social worker involved and just say, listen, you know, there's a gentleman living in this home. The family's really uncomfortable. They, you know, they own the property and they can't even access the property. We want to make sure that he's taken care of. Can you reach out and, and make him aware of the programs available and see if, if we can not create a homeless person? And see if, see if a social worker can help you out. Um, they may be able to go over there and convince him that there's this great new building across town and give him a HUD voucher for free rent, and it'll be a better, better you know, quality of life for him anyways. But uh, if you could go that route, that's certainly going to be easier than trying to get him thrown out. Although, you know, if this were California, it would be a lot different than Texas. So I think even if you have to go that route, it's maybe a couple of months. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I, I think the, the family should have an attorney on this. I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's not a simple one. And the fact that he's already tried to go to court and lay claim to the property, I would want an attorney to navigate it for the family. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the, the I know, you know, the attorney that, you know, she does have, um, I'm not sure, you know, that attorney knows what he's doing. I'm not, I'm not really sure, but it, it was just, it seems like he would have a, a clearer answer, um, or yeah. she would have a clearer answer on that. But, you know, we're still trying to figure out what, what could he appeal? I mean, what is he appealing? I mean, if it was never his, if he never, you know, had a lease agreement or, you know, anything of that nature and, and, Besides all of this, I mean, I'm not sure if he can become hostile or not, um, but um, just we don't even know if there's, you know, electric on or, or water on in that place, and I don't know if it's an unfit. I'm not sure if I could get him out that way also in case all else fails. You know, hey, this is a, um, a, a danger or to his hazard or a hazard to his health or, or whatnot. I'm not sure if I can go that route, but have you ever had to do anything like that? No, 
fortunately, I haven't. I, usually, cash for keys works. If you throw somebody fifteen hundred to two grand, they usually get out. Um, I haven't had any that any that will just dig in and stay. Um, that's why I always try to go the uh, you know the civil route versus the the legal route. Just try to try to work it out with them. But if you you know. I, <clears throat> I would, I would have an attorney get an get an attorney involved, have them pull the title and see if he did record anything. Um, if nothing's recorded, he has no claim. I don't think he has a claim at all. Have that attorney write a certified letter and have it delivered so you you have receipt of delivery. And I mean, what I, my ignorance of of landlord tenant law in this state is where I'm I'm not giving you specific advice because I'm not I haven't looked at the law, but. Chances, I mean, there's no lease. Chances are you probably have a one-month eviction process, and the sheriff will be the one that hauls his ass out if he decides not to go. Um, right. I'm thinking. I hope. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Well, you definitely gave me a great idea about the social worker because, of course, you know, I don't want to be mean and you know get over there and hey, yeah. your, your stuff is out on the street. You know what I mean? But at the same time, you know, um, you know, the, the still business. You know, and um, but yeah, that was that was great advice on the social worker. I didn't even think about that really. I thought I had thought about everything, and I, you know, didn't. But maybe this might be a way because he is still homeless. You know, uh, well, he's in a home, but um, you know, he doesn't have a car. Um, you know, he, I don't even know if he has a job. Um, so yeah, uh, that would definitely be something that I'm going to look into with the social worker thing and getting some free housing for him and whatnot. Maybe that'll give well, them a little. Once you Excellent. kind of unraveled it and found a solution, be sure to come back and share with us what the resolution was. I think everybody's curious to know, or will be curious to know. Yeah, for sure. All right, great. All well, right, guys. You. You're very welcome. Great call today, guys. It, it, what, what I found interesting in, I think, a common denominator in everybody who actively participated was they weren't theoretical situations. They were actual stories of situations everybody is encountering, which is very encouraging to to us. It tells us you're out there taking action, making calls, you know, sending letters. You're you're making contact, and you're doing what you're supposed to do, and uh, you're coming up with good good situations and great questions. So, I want to really thank everybody who actively participated today. Uh, I want to thank all of you that were here, especially those that actively participated. I want to challenge each of you, like I always do, take one thought, one idea, one thing that inspired you on today's call, go out and put it into practice, and come back next Thursday and share your results with the group. Thank you so much, guys. Make it a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you same time next Thursday. Take care.